you need to know that God loves you. Get ready. Today's show is going to bring you hope. Hello, and welcome to the Strong Tower Mental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Heidi Mortensen, licensed marriage and family therapist. And I'm so excited to have with me Susie Larson. Hello, Susie. Hey, Heidi. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is really an honor. And Susie is somebody that I have followed for a long time, as well as some other friends that I have. Um, but I feel like there's some people that haven't actually heard of Susie. I was surprised. I thought everybody knew about her because she is a national author. Um, you've written many books um, and you have a radio station as well. And is your radio station national or is it local? Yep. We're part of a network, a faith radio okay. network, which is under Northwestern Media. So it's a pretty big network, mostly in the upper uh, Midwest, a few places in the nation. But once the live okay. show goes to podcast, it's in about 170 countries. So it's it's really it's, a blessing. Um, but our podcast audience doesn't know that we're a radio station and it, that doesn't matter so much, but it's kind of fun to me that... Um, yeah, they they seem like two different worlds, but you know, God does what he does. So we're grateful. He does. So you're both national and then local here in Minnesota. So I would love if you could um, introduce yourself and then also just kind of share your testimony of how you even got into ministry in the first place. Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, just thank you for having me. And as soon as I met you, our hearts connected and I, I'm so <laughs> grateful. And but for your yeah. listeners to know, you're going to be on my show coming up yes. soon as well. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. We love to uh, address mental health, emotional health, spiritual healing and wholeness. So I, I know our listeners are going to love you. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I grew up in a large family um, and I was part of our family was part of a denomination where I knew God was real. I had a sense of his presence as a little girl, but I didn't know Jesus was accessible. I, I, I saw him hanging on the cross. I didn't understand why that was, but I always felt bad about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did have a sense of God's presence. And I was fifth of seven, mm -hmm. a real, you know, people pleaser, obedient. And, you know, um, and when I was about nine years old, I suffered a sexual assault at the hands of some teenage boys um, who pinned me down. And, um, I got up from that incident very confused about whose fault that was, what just happened. And my dad was a public person at the time. He was the mayor of our city. So I, and, and these boys were associated with some of my brother's friends. And I was just, I, I was young and I, I didn't know if I would bring scandal on our family. And mm. I just had so much going in my head and my heart. So I didn't tell anybody, but it literally opened up a canyon of insecurity and fear. I mean, I, I don't know if I slept through the night after that for a long time, because at yeah. night I would just curl in a ball and pray that nobody would get me. And um, when I was about 10 years old, I was walking home from school and uh, a different group of boys jumped me and beat me real bad. And uh, they were sitting in the dugout. They were high on something. I just, I remember as a young girl hearing, I was walking across the baseball field to get home and all I heard was get her. And they ran out of the dugout. They chased me down, knocked me to the ground and they pummeled me. They punched me in the face and kicked me and pulled fistfuls of hair out. And they just laughed wildly as they did that. And um, I know in my adult brain that they were high because they were, they had a crazed look and they were mm. laughing and I'm mm. screaming and crying. And, you know, I don't care what you say. Anybody who gets punched in the face is traumatized by it. It's, it's yeah. nobody's meant to be punched in the face. You know, we get so right. desensitized to that, but you see it on movies, but especially as a little girl being ganged up on by big teenage boys who are twice her size. You know, I, it, I was screaming and crying and mm -hmm. when they were done with me, they sort of pushed off and walked away and I had fat lip and scratches on my face and snarled hair and I, my body hurt. And I was so utterly traumatized and they were laughing as they walked away. And, uh, I heard in my ear and it wasn't audible, but it might as well have been, I heard, I can get to you anytime, anywhere, and God will never stop me. And at that moment, I knew the devil was real too. So as a little child, I thought God is real and the devil is real. And I, something kind of embedded and imprinted on me, Heidi, that I'm going to have to go through everything I fear. You know, I mean, just a spirit of fear got on me in a really big way. Mm -hmm. And I jumped to middle school. Um, I, I, you know, I often say this when I'm speaking, that if you don't know who you are, you'll misuse your time, treasure, and talents to prove 
things that Jesus has already proven, right? You'll use your time, to your gifts and abilities to dig yourself out of a hole that you're not in. And so that's sort of what wow. I did is I, um, as a gymnast, I was a decent athlete and I could sing. So I joined a special choir and I volunteered in the office and I did all these things that I probably, if I was a whole soul would have done anyway, but maybe out of fullness, but I was doing them out of absolute insecurity, fear, trying to, to dig myself out of a hole. And uh, I came to Christ in eighth grade through a, a really amazing moment, and he wooed me to himself. And as I started to read scripture, I really understood why there needed to be penalty for sin, that I understood why I needed a savior. But I will tell you, honestly, it would be many years. I knew I was saved once I started to read the gospels and understand what Jesus did for me. I knew I was saved. I did not know I was loved. And I, I would say many Christians are walking through their life right now knowing no, they're internally, they know they're secure, but they yes. don't know that they're secure in his love. They, they really don't know that they're loved and that changes everything. And, uh, when you jump ahead and got married young twenties and, um, but so, you know, as a Christian, then, you know, as a young adult Christian, I was serving like in five commit, you know, committees. And I really transferred all my striving from high school into Christianity, basically. Uh, so once again, uh, I was performing and striving and trying to help everybody and not be in anybody's debt because I, I felt like a debt to society because I was so insecure and afraid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had uh, three boys, we got a honeymoon pregnancy. And through that pregnancy, found out I had something called endometriosis, where they said, you will need a hysterectomy in your 20s. So have your kids now or never. So with middle pregnancy, I write about this in my book, Fully Alive, but I was on bed rest for three months. And during that three month time, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And then when they during the delivery, it was a traumatic delivery with a doctor who hated women. And it was so hard is that during my pregnancy, going in and out of the hospital to stop labor, I got to know the nurses and they literally said, pray that you don't get Dr. So-and-so because he hates women. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean? And they said, well, he's kind of a butcher. They, they called him Dr. Butcher for for a short, you know, because they said oh they could gosh. literally pull the sheets back on the woman's tummy and see the jagged cut and go, oh, you have Dr. So-and-so because he purposely marred women and he, and they tried to complain and they could not get him out. And he was, he was evil. Well, who do you think I got for this delivery after laboring all week, every night for a week, I get Dr. Butcher and it was a traumatic delivery. And I will just tell you, this is not exaggeration that he's as bad as he was because he in due time lost his license because enough women complained about him because he was he was terrible. So wow. that connected with some of the childhood trauma. Oh, um, I bet. Something with, uh, I to bet. me, when Kev was out of the room, when I'm in the most vulnerable position, if you can imagine. Yes. So yes. That, that began uh, like a seven year uh, journey through the wilderness for us. And so in those seasons, my friends were prospering in their health and in their finances. And we were going down deeper into the valley. So pregnancy number three, because I had to have my cervix sewn shut with pregnancy number two, it created an incompetent cervix. So at three months along, my cervix started to soften. And so they're like, we have to sew you shut and put you to bed. So six months on bed rest with a one and a three-year-old. And so you have to remember, I was an insecure person who was serving more, you know, giving more than I was taking mm. so to be put in a position for six months to have to use up all your friend favors was a nightmare come true for me. It was just confronting right. all of my insecurities. And right. um, and I was new enough in my faith that I really felt like God lost my address. You know, I mean, I'm like, and people even said that, you know, what, what did you do to chase God away? Oh, and, uh, right. Yeah. So like Job's friends. Like, yeah. yeah. Like Job's oh, friends. They were, they were, they abounded. Let me just tell you, oh. because people love to sum up suffering. If they can't understand yes. it, they've got to sum it up so they can yes. detach, right. And go, that's not going to happen to me. So there's a formula and there's a reason it happened to you. And if I can figure that out, it won't happen to me. And so that's really painful when you're on the receiving end of people's assessments. And, and let me just say, and I know you say this too, A plus B doesn't always equal C, you know, mm -hmm. it just doesn't. There aren't formulas to dictate, to get God what you always want him to do, but he mm -hmm. redeems everything. And so he he was allowing some of this stuff to expose mm -hmm. really big cracks in my foundation. But if you get to my, my that third pregnancy, bed rest for six months with a one and a three-year-old. We were stressed financially. My poor husband was mom, dad, and everything, you know, trying to mm -hmm. carry us through. I was a few months into that pregnancy. And you, I was like saying to my kids, you know, five more months till mommy can be your mommy again, four more mm -hmm. months till mommy can take you to the park. Mm -hmm. So I've been three months in, so I had three months to go. And I was pretty depressed. And my doctors had said, you know, let's get up and test the waters and see how you do. 
because I was getting pretty down and I hadn't been contracting and they said, let's just get you up. So uh, for those who are local listeners, um, I met my old college roommates in the little town of Stillwater. It was a fall day. We had lunch, went for a walk. I was very careful, but that was enough. I started to contract again at night. And so I went to bed and two weeks from that outing, someone came to visit me and said, Hey, can I get your water bottle or whatever? And I pointed and, and pins and needles shot out my arm. And as they continued to talk, this buzzing, numbing feeling started at the base of my skull and pulsated around in my face. And I was feeling pulsating numbness on my face. And I'm trying to listen to them. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I could not believe that I had three months to go and I had neurological fireworks going off in my body. And I had a friend who was getting so tired of me. Um, and she admits it later. She said, I should have cut off I should have backed out earlier. Mm -hmm. She was just starting to say really hurtful things. Yes. And uh, we had a mutual friend at our church who was a young athlete. I had an athletic bent to me. I taught fitness classes before all this happened. And she got MS and she spiraled down so fast. And so it was kind of terrible, terrible to see her walk through yeah. the hallways at church because she tremored so much. So this friend of mine who was getting tired of me came to visit and I'm like, my face is going numb. My arms are going numb. The room is spinning. I, I don't remember what day it is and like, what's happening to my body? And she goes, right. oh, really? Now this, now this, after all oh. these months, now this, she goes, you know, it's personalities like yours that most often get MS. And I'm like, what? And and when she left and she left mad and the spirit of fear got at me, Heidi, like I can't, mm. even, I mean, I, it didn't occur to me that personalities don't get, you know, I mean, I, I wish I would have had the presence of mind to sort through that, but it just, mm -hmm. it was like the enemy had me by the face. Where's your God now? Right. And long story short, a uh, bit during the pregnancy, didn't know to me, unbeknownst to me till a year later, I was bit by the deer tick and contracted Lyme disease. So once we discovered Lyme, it had been embedded in my system long enough to affect me neurologically. Uh, and it still affects me today. I've come a long, long way, uh. long way, three decades later. But um, when we found out, you can imagine the enemy was in my ear again. I can get to you anytime, anywhere, and God will never stop me. And uh, so when you read my books and you listen to my show, you will often hear a kind of a fight language, um, a, a contending for the promises, because for yeah. me, that's what I had to do. I mean, there were times in the middle of that mess where our finances were upside mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even tell you. It's like we had more medical debt than we had income and we had bill collectors calling and we had good credit when we came into marriage. So it's not right. like we were off spending our money frivolously, but the right. debt was coming in so fast and bill collectors are calling. My face is going numb. My friends are building additions on their house and going on vacation. And the contrast could not have been more stark. And mm -hmm. I, I remember in the middle of that mess, just going, I really didn't know where God was. I went from having a passion and a vision for my life to praying I would live long enough to see my kids grow up. And I remember sitting on the floor with my little boys because uh, I delivered, you know, our son and I had three little boys and I just was trying to get through the days. I'd lie on the floor and let them crawl all over me and just pray for them. And um, a woman from our church called. And she said, Susie, I've been hearing the chatter about you because some were gossiping about me and others were feeling sad for me, you know? Yes. And uh, she said, I wanted to know for myself, God, what are you doing with this family? What are you doing with this woman? Because um, they knew I was a serious follower of Christ and Lyme, they didn't know much about Lyme back then. And mm -hmm. so she brought, she goes, I brought your case before the Lord. And she said, you listen to me. She said, the Lord Jesus gave me a picture, a vision of a platform that he's building with your pain that you're going to speak from someday. So lean in and learn everything you can because you'll have a story to tell. And it was like a truth bomb dropped into my spirit. I like, I knew it was true, even though it never occurred to me, but it's like, in spite of all the neurological fireworks in my body and all the medical debt and just the upheaval in our lives, yeah. truth got in there. And around that time, the Lord just confronted me and said, Susie, are you a believer uh, because you've secured your eternity and that's it? Or do you actually believe this stuff? I mean, when are you going to shift your weight onto the promises Come on. to see if they stand? And, yes. and he said, every time you turn your back on faith to behold fear, you're, you're, rendering your life impotent, turn your back on fear and behold faith. And so I learned as a young person, and I really had no <sighs> training in this. I just had the hellish fight for my life and the living word of God. And I started to find promises that leapt off the page. And I'm like, you know what? I learned that the abundant life doesn't come to your door wrapped up in a tidy bow. Jesus <laughs> wanted for us, but we have a thief who comes to steal, kill and destroy. So that's when I started to fight and started to contend for the mm -hmm. promises of God. And I think when the Lord gives you a vision for your life, mm -hmm. 
and a strong sense of your purpose, you've got something to fight for. But without a vision, people cast off restraint. Yeah. Without a vision, people perish. And the Lord was kind enough in the middle of this battle to give me a vision and a purpose and to go, I'm not finished with you yet. The devil will not have the last say. And so that's kind of what, when you read my books and hear uh, my show, it's coming out of a place of contending for the promises and getting back what the enemy stole because he does not get to have the last say. Wow. This is so good. And this is actually what, what's really happening to a lot of us here, a lot of us believers right now, where I just feel there's a lot of overwhelm. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things that are even just taking believers to not, to not have that fight. Right. And, and even kind of just apathy. And, um, but one of the things that I, I feel like that I've seen and that you touched on is that there's many believers that are saved, but they don't know the love of God. Um, and even just the power of the word, you know, it's, it's like, it's just, just a book, you know, no, it's not just a book. So how did you move from, you know, just dying to go to heaven to really understanding and connecting that the word of God is alive and that God is a loving father. Actually, one thing that you said in your book, um, this book right here, by the way, strong in battle, you said that we need to strengthen our attachment to our perfect father. I mean, that's therapy right there. That that's like attachment theory. Um, so that, that really, really hit me because as a therapist that we need that, that attachment to God instead of our brokenness and our hurt. Exactly. So how did you move into that place of understanding the love of God instead of just salvation? Yeah, I appreciate that question. So around that time when God was breaking his silence, because it was very silent for a while. And, you know, it's, it, I'll be honest, at that time, the word felt dead on the page. I would read. But, you know, when you go through seasons of testing, there are times where, you know, you, you don't get feelings with it, you know, but you, you know, the word is still living and active, even if it doesn't feel true, it is still is true. Right. Yes. But around yes. that time, uh, I remember crying out to God going, where is the victory Lord? Because I memorize scripture. I read scripture with a brain that wasn't working. Lyme had wiped out my short-term oh. memory. I've got three little kids oh my gosh. I'm barely hanging on here, but I'm still making time to get in the word to pray. But I get up from this quiet times and I'm still the same fearful, insecure person I was. So where is the victory God? I need you to talk to me about this. And he broke through my silence and said, Susie, I get that you love me but you don't seem to get that I love you. So mm -hmm. until I tell you different, every time you want to say, I love you, Lord, I want you to turn it around and say, you love me, Lord, say it now. So I said, you love me, Lord. And it felt like a foreign language in my mouth. I'd yell at my kids and then I'd feel bad about it. And he'd say, say it now. You love me, Lord. You know, I'd make the dinner and not burn it. And he'd go, say it now. You love me, Lord. And it's like at every turn, he'd say, say it now. You love me, Lord. And I wondered, is this some kind of self-help affirmation thing? And I wanted it to be a biblical practice. So I looked at scripture and it's all over there. It's not yeah. that we love God. It's that he loved us. He loved yes. us first and he keeps loving us first. It's not yeah. how high we jump. It's that he stoops down to make us great. And so I will tell you, the more that you ponder the love of God, the more it will heal you. I did go through counseling to address the trauma and I thought that was important, but nothing healed me or change me, like meditating on the father's affection for me. And, you know, jumping ahead to, to now about eight years ago, I, I had a pretty massive relapse and we can talk about that over lunch someday. I don't need to get into that here, but it was pretty devastating for me. And, and it affected my cognitive ability. It was, I had a lot to come back from. And, uh, so I started to really learn about the neuroplasticity of the brain and the importance of, and the, your capacity to come back from some of these things. Yeah. And I would have brain scientists on my show because I'm super interested in it. I'm telling my listeners, I pray this is interesting for you, but I got some questions. And I had Dr. Tim Jennings on a bunch of times, but one of the times he gave our listeners a, a charge. And I give this to your listeners today. He said, if you spend 15 minutes a day for the next 30 days, pondering God's love for you, not your love for him. Now your love for him is important, but it's most of us are focusing on how high we can jump. And when we do that, our faith is reduced to ought to's and should do's and ought to's and should do's. And that's how you get tired. So he's like, Focus on his love for you. 15 minutes a day. He goes, I promise you in 30 days, you'll change your physiology. You'll change your brain structure. And of course, you'll change your faith perspective. And it is just true because when you live loved, suddenly you just want to worship him because you're, you're his, you bear his image. 
But if it all becomes about how high we can jump, it's, you know, we will wear ourselves out and we become very religious. But when yeah. you ponder the love of God and yeah. you meditate on the love of God and it's imprinted mm -hmm. on your cellular, at your cellular level, you yeah. start to change. So that was one thing. The other thing is, is, you know, a lot of people say you have, you know, people who've walked with God a long time, if you're in the word, there'll be a story or a Psalm or something that you kind of go back to again and again. And they, they'll refer to that as your life script. Like there's something, and there's a, something in that living word that speaks to your living story. Yeah. And I would say Psalm 18 is that for me, because it's a picture of going from a victim to a victor. It's a picture of, if you look at it, there's a progression that happens. I got a hold of that when I was a young, young person in the battle for my life. And it's just like an anchor for me because it, you know, the psalmist says, I cried out to the Lord. The enemy attacked me at a moment when I was weakest. You know, he confronted me at a time when I couldn't defend myself, but my cry reached God's ears and he reached down and it shows how God mounted on the cherubim and he flew and he veiled his approach in thick darkness. And when you think about that, you don't see him coming, but neither does your enemy. So there's times you're in this dark storm and you think he's nowhere. No, he's on his way. He right. reached down from on high. He rescues you because he delights in you. He puts you in a spacious place. He lets you heal. But if you follow the, the progression of the Psalm, then he trains your hands for battle. So that Come he on. strengthens your arms to bend a bow of bronze. He teaches you to walk on high places. And then a little later, you chase your enemies down until they're defeated. So you go from victim to victor. And Heidi, that was one that just gave me a vision for I am not I'm not going to let my inner sissy have the last say, and I'm not having the enemy have the last say, Lord God in heaven, let the weak say I'm strong. Make me into somebody I never dreamed I could be because I had so much fear. And I've been super honest over the years that I've overcome fear in layers. And I, I'm not fearless. I've got a long way to go, but I am not the person I used to be. But I think getting that vision for what God wants to do and keeping his love before you, I'll, I'll just wrap here with first John four sixteen. It says, and so we know and rely on the love God mm -hmm. has for us. So the word no is experiential. It's really, it's akin to sexual intercourse between a man and a woman where there's an, a, an experiential encounter mm -hmm. with the love of God. So, you know, and experience and encounter God's love, mm -hmm. and then you rely on that love. And in Ephesians, it says to know this love is to be filled with the fullness of God. So it comes back around that if you spend the rest of your life seeking to know God's love, you'll be better for it and it'll change how you live and even change how you view yourself and other people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely does. Like you, your, your lens shifts instead of seeing what the enemy sees and the judgment and the bitterness and all of the things that you actually address in many of your books and that we see actually how God sees, like, instead of looking down, you know, looking at ourselves, we're able to look up and then he gives us that vision um, you, you know, in your book, you talk about, um, you have a story where you use the word trauma fear. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Um, I'll just use the I word trauma. I made it up. Just you, want you to know, but I, it's oh, a I thing. Love it. <laughs> no, I love it. It's, it's a really good. Cause in therapy, we talk about the word naming, like we'll name things like, you know, and when you name it, it um, we, it's, this is a narrative technique, you know, we'd call it the different. So like you name something and when you name it, it kind of takes it away from you, you know? So like, I'm not a fearful person, but fear will try to influence me. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. this thing that's like separate from who we are. And a lot of times people will say, well, I'm just anxious. No, you're not anxious. Anxiety is coming to influence you. So it's a separate part of who you are. So I, I like that you use that language. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. Um, Cause I think there's many of us that actually experience that. And how do we know the difference between um, that and a, um, like a warning. Yes. So I love that you asked about that because I would say what I'm hearing from people in the last few years, especially is irrational fears are just mm -hmm. on the uprise because there's so many unresolved fears buried in the soul. And if you keep yeah. those things lingering and don't resolve those in the light of God's love and his word, they are just sort of waiting to explode. And suddenly you'll find yourself irrationally afraid of going, this makes no sense, yeah. but it is an accumulation of things not dealt with in the soul. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the open of strong in battle, I talk about a time where once again, for me, it was an accumulation of things not dealt with. One of my sons was starting to wander from the faith and, and we were so purposeful in the way we raised him to know the love of God. And, um, so that was lingering in my soul. And I was out of state at a writer's conference and I was staying in the basement of a friend's home in the middle of the night, I woke up and I had this like knowing 
terror, trauma, fear that he was not going to make it out of his twenties, that he was going to die. And I, it was visceral. I could feel it. And I, I fell out of bed. I got on my knees and I interceded for him all night long. Oh God, oh God, protect him. And I just, mm -hmm. I prayed and cried and begged and pled and, and just whatever. And the next morning I was so wrung out. I was just absolutely exhausted. I call that a trauma fear because he's in his thirties now for one thing, but the idea that there was no peace, there was no resolution. And there was, was there were lingering fears that I had not dealt with around his choices in the earlier months. Trauma fear, what the enemy is trying to do is he takes past fears and past experiences that you've not resolved. And this is why it's super important to resolve some of the parts of our past yes. things you've not yeah. resolved to get you to project a fear, a worse fear into a future that God's not in. That's what the enemy is trying to do is going, if God allowed all of this, then how much more? There's really not a limit to what he'll allow. And he takes all of the things you've not sorted out. So you still have maybe questions about God, maybe even accusations against God. And he takes all of that, heaps it up, put, puts a worst case scenario together, puts mm -hmm. it in your face and tries to get you imagine a future that God's not in. And the shouting theme behind that is you can't trust God. Now mm -hmm. that, that's the theme of a trauma fear. But if you're a believer, there's no future moment that God is not in. No such scenario right. exists in the life of the believer. We're meant to go from strength to strength, glory to glory, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. And I often say his threat against you is very connected to your threat against him. So instead of letting yourself being absolutely lured into a trauma fear where you have a, a visceral physical, uh, you know, um, um, reaction, get a sense of what, what is he threatened by in me? What about my story is such a threat to him that he's messing with me? Remember that you're an heir. So that's the trauma fear. The God-given warning is when you're walking intimately with God and you heed his voice in your ear and he brings a conviction or a correction or a redirection and there's a sobriety about it and there's a peace about it. Yeah. And it. Now the enemy can get in there with the trauma fear if you're not dealing with the stuff in your life, but there's it's a big difference. I mean, I remember hearing from some young men who were headed to worship practice one night in the Twin Cities here and just felt the prompting of the Lord, separate, driving in separate cars, prompting of the Lord to take a different way to church. And that was the night the 35W bridge collapsed. Yeah. That would have been where they would have been on, but they felt this wow. God, and it made them late and they were on the worship team, but they both separate felt the prompting to take a different way, which wow. made them late, but saved their lives. So the God given warning, I think is comes with sobriety. And there's times where you're, maybe you've gotten away with stuff before things that are lawful, but not profitable, you know, things that hinder and slow you down. Like Hebrews talks about where just because you've been able to do it before, doesn't mean you can do it now or in the future based mm -hmm. on what the, whatever the purpose of God has for you, what right. the plans of the enemy has for you. Yeah. And we get this, we love autopilot. So we get an unnecessary sense of safety and security in the wrong things. So a God-given warning would be, and that was okay before. It's not okay for you in this next season. So heed the voice of the Lord and practice some restraint, that kind of a thing. And I just think they're, they're coming from two very different sources. And so mm. the fruit of them is so different. That is so good. I mean, I love that you're talking about where there's unresolved, there's something unresolved. And I think sometimes we'll ignore those. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were, but then the Lord really highlighted for you that you needed to deal with that. Can, can you talk a little bit about your therapy experience? I just love that you're so open and vulnerable and authentic. Um, would you mind just kind of sharing about that for people who are hesitant to, to step into therapy? And I think sometimes people in ministry and in churches are like, oh, you know, we're not going to go leave in a, a, go to a psychologist or a therapist. And could you, could you talk about your experience of sure. mental health therapy? Because yeah, no one's ever asked me that. I yeah, appreciate that. And Thank I you. honestly think it's pride to think that you can't or shouldn't, or I think it's pride because everybody needs a therapist at some point in their life. I mean, my friend explains it this way. Life has a way of lifing you, you know? <laughs> and I just think, you know, based on different seasons of our lives, we need someone to walk with us. We need some help. And so I think, um, you know, the first time I got, I was connected with someone that helped me. It was so interesting. So because of the particular denomination that I was in, uh, we weren't really allowed to be reading the Bible on our own. And so I was sneaking to a Bible study and lying about it. 
so I'm coming clean. So yeah. I told my mom and my family I was going to the library and I went wow. to this Bible study where what I didn't know till years later, till I was married and had kids, was this Bible study leader worked with troubled youth. So I'm the only one sitting in this group of very goth looking kids and I got my letter jacket oh. on and they're like, hey, you want to go out for a smoke? And I'm like, I'm good. And I, they didn't know why I was there and I didn't know why they were there. And I, I became that. friends with, I got the leader later and he worked with a ministry for troubled youth. And he's like, he never wanted to ask me what I was doing there because he didn't want to make me self-aware. <laughs> right? But this is his brilliance. So this shows you how old I am too, but he loaned me a cassette tape. For those of uh -huh. you young people, you'll have to Google it, but um, <laughs> of a message by Howie Hendricks that he thought would be good for me to hear. And he needed it back by let's say Monday. Okay. But we have seven kids in our family and about four of us, I think three or four were drivers and we were all taking turns using my mom's car. I could not get the car on that Monday to bring it to him. So I brought it on Wednesday. And I couldn't look at him. I had so much shame mm -hmm. and I, I handed him the cassette tape and I thought for sure I'd be kicked out of the group. And I, I could not look at him. And I said, I'm so sorry. I couldn't get here. My mom's car, blah, blah, blah. And he had the wisdom to go come into my office and talk to me for a minute. And I said, okay. And he said, who hurt you? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? And he goes, who put their hands on you? I'm like, no, no one. I just, I couldn't get my mom's car to get you this. He goes, let me put it this way. And he was a little more graphic with what he described. You know, somebody, some boys put their hands on you. When did they do that? Wow. And I'm like, <clears throat> and all of a sudden guttural sobs. I mean, I was 18. So Aww. this was, you know, nine years later after I'd not said a word to anyone, mm -hmm. I'm doubled over guttural sobbing in his office. And he said, write down in detail, go home and write in detail what those boys did to you. And if it doesn't rip your guts out, you're not being honest enough. He says that self-hatred will kill you. We're going to get it out of you. So he oh. met with me once a week and then sometimes once a month and oh. walked with me through. And then when I was in college, I was dating a guy that was bad for me. And he leaned in over the table and he said, you have more gifting and potential in your pinky than I do in my whole body, but I'm not going to waste my time with you if you're going to waste your time with him. So it's him or me. Oh. And I'm like, you. <laughs> and I broke up with oh. the guy. Yeah. But I mean, just having that kind of spiritual, and I had no idea, like people were supporting his ministry, why he had time with me. And he and his wife, they had three daughters. They would have me over for dinner. I, I had no idea why he would make time for me, but it was just the call of God on his life. Wow. It so shaped my thinking. I can't even tell you. So then wow. you jump ahead and I'm, you know, I'm a young mom after seven year battle uh, of the first phase of Lyme. I mean, I've battled throughout, but the first seven years were really especially brutal mm. with, you know, hysterectomy and all the medical debt ah. and a move and a move back. And uh, what I didn't realize was uh, we'd moved to Colorado, came back and our, because of our medical debt, we weren't able to uh, buy a home. So we rented a home that I affectionately called a pea house because every part of it was pea yellow inside, outside carpet walls. It just reminded me of pea, oh. but you know, it's like, and I, it felt like my life. There was no color to it. And, and I, I didn't know at that moment, but I was Aww. depressed. So I, I, so I went to see a counselor and he says, you have an accumulative, you have a series of unresolved losses Mm -hmm. In this last seven years that this accumulation, so my serotonin level had dropped. It just been ah, so stressful. Yeah. So for a year, um, I'm just being super honest. I was on Zoloft and I saw him once a week wow. and, and then I knew it was time for me to get off of it. And he helped me wean it off. He goes, this, you did it classic, you know, just because it was just, I wanted to have that buffer because the way yeah, he described it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like things hit me like a steel tipped arrow that should have helped hit me like a nerf arrow. And that's how, you know, you need help when things that should hit you like a nerf arrow go in like a steel tip, you just need some buffer. And so I was on a low dose of that while I went to see him week after week and sorted through my losses and wow. the, the pain of being sick as a young mom. And then I weaned off of that and, and I, I didn't, you know, we were good and I went on my way. And then, you know, when I relapsed, I would say a few different times in my church experience, there were godly older women who did prayer ministry times where certain things happen in life and, it, and something will surface and it's God <laughs> scooping into your soil going, we're going to take care of this. So yeah. that happened plenty of times where just godly older women got around me and helped me get the boulders out of my soil. And um, again, it's just, I think we're works in progress. So I, I just have no problem admitting that. And I think that's oh. why I'm so healed as you know, yes. and, um, and then I've just had stretches where, um, when the relapse happens eight years ago, I have a friend who is a counselor and I signed up for a handful of sessions with her. Cause I said, I'm so disappointed in God that he let this happen. And I, I love him so much, 
I'm so hurt that he let this happen at my mm -hmm. age. And so I, I hate that. And I know it's not right. So let's work this out. Mm -hmm. And we walked it through. And uh, so that's kind of what that's looked like kind of as a needed basis. The Lord has brought me the people that I've needed. So I love this there. I feel like there's shame that's being broken off people who are listening to this Praise because God. I feel like that there's, you know, where it's like, Oh, I had to take medication. This is so bad that I, it's like, no, God, like, you, you know, you're it, he uses this, but I really, really love that you went to therapy at the same time. I think that there's a lot of people that are just on medication and they don't do the therapy piece. So they kind of skip the part of dealing with the unresolved trauma and the unresolved issues. So I really appreciate that you went to therapy at the same time. And, you know, if you listen to my show, you know, once a month, we have a functional med doc on and we talk health mm. and the healing process. And that very much, you know, my book fully alive is I say what happens in our soul happens in our cells, that there's a yeah. physiological implication to shame, fear, insecurity, all those things. Yeah. So I feel very strongly about an overuse of meds in every, in every realm. I think we way over medicate because yes. we want a silver bullet. We want a quick fix. Yeah. And so I think there's a place for them. But I do address that just because I think we sometimes don't want to do the hard work of digging in. But if you want to do the hard work, you need a counselor, you need a spiritual director. But mm -hmm. I'm imploring people because it's like our bodies are designed to heal. Our physiology wants to heal. It's God good. has made us so fearfully and wonderfully. So part of that is on us that I want a quick silver bullet. And then there's side effects of all those things and implications of those things. And you might be numbed, but you might, you're not free. Right. And let me just tell you, Heidi, you know, I pray because of that depression stretch that I went through, I would say almost every time. And that was 30 years ago, maybe mm -hmm. uh, almost every time I speak, I pray for the depressed and for the anxious that God would bring healing so that they would wake up. And have a spring in their step because one thing i noticed is I, my motivation was gone i didn't have the spring in my step it was like a lead blanket was on me so i pray very specifically for the depressed and for the sick and all that mm. for healing for miraculous healing mm. and i don't have this great batting average but one day one gal when I, I think it was a canada event she wrote me a letter and she said she was on five medicines. She was so numbed out because this is what overuse of medicine does and being overprescribed. Yeah. She was functional. She just mm -hmm. sat there and just was lethargic. And so her husband did the 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 husband wife, you know, parenting. Yeah. Everything. And and she just said she was not functional. But that was her. That was felt like her only option. Yeah. Well, what she did re remember at the retreat was that she'd forgot to bring her medicine. But the Friday night, I'd prayed for healing, and she woke up the next morning happy to be there, not realizing she hadn't taken her medicine. And the next morning she woke up happy and then she was home on that Monday and she did a bunch of laundry and she helped with the dishes. And it wasn't till like Wednesday that her husband's like, what has happened to you? Like you're doing the dishes, you're cooking meals. Come you're joyful. On. And he's, yeah. And he's like, have you, what happened? And she's like, I haven't had my medicine since last Thursday. And she really had a miraculous healing. And she would testify, I was over medicated. And, you know, and it's like, we, I think the question has to be, what am I trying so hard not to feel? Mm -hmm. Because you have to feel it to heal it. So yes. I want to have a healthy balance there to get through so you can face things. There is a place yeah. for it, but there's so much healing that God has for you. I just believe yeah. that so strongly. Yeah. You have to feel it to heal it. I love yeah. that. Well, before we have you pray for the listeners, I would love if there's like anything else that you feel that's just on your heart and that you feel that you want to share before I have you pray. Yeah. You know, I've been sitting in uh, Psalm 106 lately and I'm in the amplified version today um, because, you know, there's still things I'm waiting for a breakthrough, you know, I mean, just to be, keep it real. The ringing in my ears on a scale of one to 10 is like a 12 or 13. It's uh, so loud, so constantly that in the wow. quiet, it's hard to hear myself think, you know, and yeah. insomnia is a chronic issue for me. And if I don't sleep, I wake up and my neck is numb and I don't feel well. So I'm not, I don't want to paint the picture that I'm, I, I've arrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a constant contending for full healing. And I'm believing that I'm going to see it, but I'm still way better than I was. But all that to say, yeah. everybody in some way, shape or fashion is waiting for a breakthrough. Everybody yeah. is. Yeah. And what I'm so interested because of the days that we're in, what got the Israelites exiled to Babylon? Why didn't that first generation out of Egypt make it to the promised land? What did they do wrong? So I've been looking at that because I'm like, I want to do it right. And some of the things that scripture uh, talks about is one is they stopped listening to God. And when they stopped listening, their hearts got hard because you can only listen to one voice at a time. 
So if you're listening to your inner critic or the culture or whatever, mm -hmm. any other voice than God's will harden your heart against God. I just think that's super important. So that now is. jumping to Psalm 106, it talks about praising the Lord and who mm -hmm. can praise him half enough and to mm -hmm. give him the glory he deserves. And then it goes on to say, you know, remember me, Lord, when you favor your people, visit me with your salvation when you rescue them. May mm -hmm. I see the prosperity of your chosen one. So he's giving thanks to God and he's putting himself in the, on the path of God's promises going, remember me. I'm your child. And here is where he acknowledges the, how his forefathers had sinned. We have sinned like our fathers. We've committed iniquity. We've behaved wickedly. So listen to this. Our fathers in Egypt did not. The first thing they didn't do was understand or appreciate God's miracles. They didn't understand or appreciate his miracles. And on my show, one of my guests was saying how Rahab you know, she, the miracle that she talked about that gave her faith to be rescued from Jericho, the miracle she referred to happened before she was born, but it carried so much weight for her that it allowed her to believe in a God she could not see and leave a pagan people. Now he, he's the same God. So if you don't yeah. see your miracle right now to seek, to understand and appreciate the miracles of old, bring them from the past, pull them into the present and say, wow. he is the same God. These yes. miracles happen. And then look at your own history. You've got a miracle history. There mm -hmm. are things God has done, but mm -hmm. Heidi, we're such impatient people mm -hmm. and we want such quick fixes that I bet you, if you look back in the past week, you could say, I've seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Remember, understand and appreciate it because the Israelites went wrong when they were so quick to forget God's goodness. So yeah. that's the first thing they didn't understand or appreciate his miracles. The second thing is they did not remember the abundance of his mercies. Now I want you to think about this. You can't get close to the sun without it burning you up, but you right. can get close to the sun, the son of God. And why aren't, wouldn't you be burned up when we are such a pile of contradictions? Why can you go mm -hmm. intimately into the throne room of almighty God? Well, the answer is in Lamentations. It says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. That's why we're not consumed, because of the Lord's great love. His compassions never fail. His mercies are new every morning. Yeah. So he sends you mercies to your door before you even mess up, because he knows you're going to need them. His mercies are so abundant. And Heidi, we forget about the abundant mercies when we get into an entitlement phase, where yeah. I deserve more than God is giving me. And we can get there in that time in between very quickly, where we pout, we whine, we grow. You know, we judge the Israelites, but we do the very same thing. So how do you keep yourself tender in the meantime, while you're waiting, you understand and appreciate his miracles. You remember the abundance of his mercies. And finally, the third thing this hit me so hard, they did not imprint his loving kindness on their hearts. I think that is so powerful. And that the book that follows, I have a book coming out in August called Closer Than Your Next Breath. It's about the presence of God. Oh. The devotional that follows that, that springs out of that is yeah. about how to retrain your brain and your heart from moving to bracing for impact to anticipating God's goodness. Because wow. so many people in the last years have been, have developed a posture of waiting for the next shoe to drop. And I was one as well with the health mm -hmm. challenges, yeah. but that is not the posture of faith. God wants us to right. wonder what amazing thing he has up his sleeve. And so to imprint his loving kindness on our hearts is to look at every good gift in our life and see a gift tag on it to Heidi yeah. from God, to Heidi yeah. from God, you know, to Susie from God. And when you, when you attach the every good gift and tether it to a father, it strengthens your attachment to that father because you go, yeah. I have a good father. And that's how yeah. you imprint his loving kindness on your heart. So all that to say, I don't want to make the mistake the Israelites did. I want to make those miracles of old as present today as they've ever been because he's the same God. I want to marvel in his morning mercies because we all blow it multiple times yeah. a day and he's yeah. already made provision. And yeah. I want to be so obsessed with his goodness that when the enemy comes to accuse God, I'm like, no, it's already imprinted in my heart. I already know that my God is good and he will always make a way for me. So that's a mouthful, but that's where I'm sitting these days. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. As, as you speak, I could just, the presence of the Lord increases because mm. you're, it's just what you carry. You, you, mm. and yeah, I mean, it's, this is, and especially combining it with this, the word that he's sharing with you right now. Um, it's, I think it's perfect for praying and you carry healing hands, mm -hmm. um, because of the testimony, even the testimony that you just released. So I would love it if you could pray for the listeners. Absolutely. And I, and I'm actually praying, um, as I pray 
that that your hearts would be open to the possibility of a now miracle. I mean, so many of us have had to walk out a process miracle, but he still does now miracles. He yes. still does in a moment. And so that maybe believe possibly yeah. that your suddenly miracle could happen today. And yeah. you've been waiting a long time and he sees it and he knows. So Father, yeah. I lift up my dear one watching today, listening today, who's been battling depression a long time. And Father, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we put the cross of Jesus Christ between this friend and depression, anxiety. Lord God, we break it off in the name of Jesus. Lord, for whatever reason uh, they're dealing, whether it's an accumulation of losses, a chemical imbalance, an enemy attack, it doesn't matter. God, I pray that you'd put right what's wrong in their body, that you'd restore the communication in their body, restore the chemical balance, restore the years the enemy has stolen, restore their joy, oh God, turn their sorrow into joy. We pray for a miraculous healing like the one I testified about, where they may even, you know, realize they forgot to take their medicine because they're so joyful. I just pray for radical, miraculous healing from mental health issues. And Lord God, I'm also praying for ra radical, miraculous healing from chronic health issues, from, from Lyme disease, MS, uh, whatever. I just ask you to cut off that curse of affliction. And I pray you'd establish the flow of healing and that we would know a vitality in our day, uh, that you'd renew our youth in such a way that people will ask us what has happened to you. And we can testify that he's the one, our God, who's bound up my wounds. He's healed my broken heart. He restored my soul. He's made me whole. He's the one who's renewed my youth. I pray that you would redeem and restore us in such a way that many would ask about the hope that's within us because they see hope all over us, God. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You care about the human condition. Not only are you securing an amazing eternity for us, that you do bless our lives in the land of the living. May we see your goodness. May we see the miracles we long to see. And may we walk intimately with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How how can our listeners get a hold of you? How can they get your books? I know Strong in Battle is the one that's out right now, and you have Closer Than Your Next Breath coming out this fall. Um, how can they find out more out about you? Sure. SusieLarson.com is my website. And then if you want to catch the live radio show, um, if, you, the, if you go onto your podcast player, you'll find it there. You okay. can listen live. We give books away all the time. That's awesome. MyFaithRadio.com, or you could get the Faith Radio app and live stream because we give books away every day. But if you just want to catch the podcast after, go to any podcast player and search for me. And uh, then you'll get to hear Heidi on my show. So we have some pretty amazing guests. So otherwise, SusieLarson.com. And I'm on this uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Okay. And then I'm just going to just spell it out for those of you who are listening. It's S-U-S-I-E-L-A-R-S-O-N.com. Um, and then faithradio.com or .net. My Faith Radio. My, my Faith, Faith Radio. Radio.com. That would allow you to okay. live stream on my three o'clock mm -hmm. Central Standard Time. But yep. otherwise you can get the app for free, download it or catch the podcast after. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Susie. It's been an honor to have you on. Well, what a joy. Thank you for having me, Heidi.